1970s also saw an explosion in black literary culture that reflected contemporary themes of race, motherhood, womanhood, and class. Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye was published at the top of the decade, and her work as an editor helped propel other black authors into publication. In 1975, The Color Purple author Alice Walker published an essay titled Looking for Zora, which helped renew attention to Zora Neale Hurston's 1937 novel Their Eyes Were Watching God. Acts like Gladys Knight and the Pips, the OJ, Stevie Wonder, and Dionne Warwick were very popular, but the group that was perhaps only second to the Beatles in terms of establishing modern day stand culture was the Jackson 5, who dominated the charts for the first two years of the 70s. Then there was of course disco music, which found its primary audience in black people, Latinos, women, and gays attending dance parties. For most of American history, integrated dance halls were frowned upon, so disco was a phenomenon also because it brought together integrated audiences who danced in close spaces. It was eventually packaged to be an upscale and white fixture of gay clubs, but it would always be associated with black people because it was influenced by R&B, soul, and funk. Therefore, when I think of disco, I think of Donna Summer, Sister Sledge, Chic and Grace Jones. By 1979, radios were switching to all disco formats. There were over 20,000 disco texts to go shake your ass in, and that year, the Saturday Night Fever soundtrack won Album of the Year at the Grammys. A Chicago DJ named Steve Dahl claims he was fired shortly after his former rock station switched to disco, and he began printing Kill Disco membership cards. It's really no surprise that suburban white boys saw disco as too black or too gay or too feminine, so they coined the term disco sucks. In July 1979, the Chicago White Sox, who had fledgling attendance numbers, sponsored a disco demolition with Steve Dahl at the helm. Fans who brought a disco record could get in for less than a dollar. This event attracted nearly 50,000 people, most of them white teens. A black usher who worked the stadium named Vince Lawrence noticed that people were bringing not just disco records, but records by black artists in general. A second game was supposed to occur, but the crowd went nuts and began rioting, so the Sox had to forfeit.